Good evening. Uh, Get your Bible open to the book of Luke, or the Gospel of Luke, and that's where we will be uh, this evening. I do want to clarify one thing that was said this morning from that, and that is this. I was not nearly as aggressive about finishing John in our class as Dad portrayed it. I'm very excited, and it's possible, it's very possible that my excitement just overflowed and became aggressive-ish, but it was excitement nonetheless. Uh, I'm really, really excited for our study on John on Wednesday nights. Um, If you were able to be here in person or online, I think it was a really, really great study, great first class on uh, this past Wednesday night. We really set some sort of foundational pieces for how we're going to go through and study uh, the book of John, and essentially... Like, like Dad mentioned, what we're doing in, uh, on Wednesdays is going to be a slower and more, I don't want to say intentional, but more detailed version of what we've been doing with this series. Uh, over the course of this series, I mentioned at the beginning, this was based on a, a book that I read for school called Reading Backwards, and, and the concept was very simple yet very interesting to me and it was that you need to read the new in light of the old like you would read a normal story but you also need to read the old in light of the new and both should enrich the other Um, and so we took some time talking about that at the beginning of the series and what we've done is looked at each of the gospels and how uh, how the author of the gospel does exactly that Uh, first if you remember we looked at uh, Mark and I, I got to be honest, I think Mark is one of my favorites to do this. I, he might be surpassed by John after, after we're done studying John. But Mark does it in a way that just really, I don't know, connects with the way that my brain works. Uh, Mark, he would make points very subtly. If you remember, Mark would reference the Old Testament with phrases and certain word orders, and he would tell a story, and then he would have the, uh, in the story, he would have Jesus do something that only God could do, and at the end of the story, instead of saying, and only God could do this, so therefore Jesus is God, instead of saying it overtly, he would have a character in the story ask a question, who is this that even the winds and seas obey him? And as the reader, Mark wants you to answer that question. Well, the only person who can control the winds and the seas is God. Looks like he's saying Jesus is God. And Mark does this repeatedly. We looked at several different things. Uh, the shepherd of Israel, uh, the, someone who has the authority to forgive sins, and several other examples all throughout Mark. He's referencing the Old Testament over and over again. And understanding the Old Testament helps you understand what Mark is saying about Jesus. Just like understanding who Jesus is gives you a better understanding of how the Old Testament was written and what it meant. Then we looked, if you remember, at Matthew. And Matthew is completely different than Mark. It's like the yin and the yang. Uh, Matthew is as, as overt and obvious as someone could be that Jesus is connected to the Old Testament. Uh, if you remember, there was just uh, a couple of chapters. There was, I think, three chapters that we were looking at. And in those three chapters, Matthew referenced nine Old Testament passages. And every single one of them, he said, this was written in order to fulfill, uh, this was done in order to fulfill what was written of by the prophet, so-and-so, when he said, and then Matthew quotes it. Matthew also takes some of the things that Mark references and goes, hey, by the way, this is where that is, right? He'll use the same story in the same language, and then he'll add just two more lines and say, like was spoken of by the prophet Daniel. And so Matthew and Mark have completely different but very complementary ways of going about connecting the Old and the New Testament into one uh, big story. And when we studied Matthew, if you remember, uh, we looked at some of the different ways that Matthew does this, how he uses different words to mean different things uh, in the sense of specifically with the word fulfilled. If you remember the way we looked at the way Matthew uses these prophecies and uses this language is a little different than we think of it, and we really need to read the way that Matthew is, uh, is writing, not necessarily the way that we would understand it initially. Basically, a lot of words. Understand the author's intention 
and you will understand better what he wrote. And so when we read Matthew, we need to understand where he's coming from and how he's using these passages and words, um, similar to how Mark did it, but in a very different way. So then tonight, uh, we have Luke, and Luke is, he, he's a little more like Mark in the sense that he likes to sort of dance around the idea, but he's also a little bit like Matthew in the sense that he likes to uh, have quotations. There's a, a unique characteristic of Luke, and it's that he really likes having characters in the story be the ones to quote the verses. Uh, Matthew, as he would write, he would write about Jesus, he'd write something that Jesus did, and then he'd get to a spot, and Matthew would poke his head out from behind the curtain and say, this was done in order to fulfill what was spoken of by the prophet. Back in, and then the story continues. Luke weaves these references into his story. Uh, if you look, you see in, um, in uh, uh, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 3, you see that there is a, uh, in chapter 3 and verse 4, it's written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, and he references this passage. But you notice this is a, uh, a quotation that starts up back in the beginning of the chapter, or uh, in verse 2, where it says, During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, and he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written. Therefore, he, uh, he said to the crowds that came out and baptized him, and then he continues into the discourse. You notice that while Luke is referencing these passages, he's doing it a little bit differently than the way Matthew did it. He's not saying this happened in order to fulfill this. Rather, he's weaving it into the story like he's telling one narrative. Uh, we're going to look at a couple different ways that he does this. Ultimately, what Luke wants you to understand is the same thing that Matthew wants you to understand, which is the same thing that Mark wants you to understand. And when you guys understand that I've preached the same lesson three times, you might not want me to do that anymore. But you're going to see that these, this is what the gospel did. It said the same thing in four different ways. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are all making the same case. Jesus is God. God came in the flesh. John says it more explicitly, right? But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they do it a little bit differently. And so when we look at Luke and we ask, how is he saying this? What is he, how is he getting that point across? Um, it, it's not as easy to see. There, there's a longstanding tradition. If you go back and you read some uh, scholars on, on the subject, you'll see that there are a lot of people who think that Luke doesn't believe Jesus is God. And there's a lot of writings on it, and they have these points about how uh, he doesn't ever mention it, he doesn't make the points. And the bottom line is, if you read carefully, and you read in light of the Old Testament, and you understand the positions that Luke describes Jesus being in, it's nearly impossible to get through the book and not have him be God in the flesh. And so that's what we're going to really address and look at tonight. Um, Luke does this, we're going to look at two and a half ways that Luke does this, and then we're going to try and wrap up the whole series with a couple of takeaways that I think are, are vitally important to the Christian life. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is look at Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Uh, one of the first things that Luke does that shows that Jesus is God is that he uses them interchangeably. Uh, as, this is something that we don't pick up on as well, because I don't know if we just take this fact for granted that Jesus is God, but when we read through the story, we just kind of we take that for granted, and then we don't pick up on these little details. But there's this thing that Luke does where he will flip-flop the name of God and the name of Jesus, and he'll use both interchangeably. Uh, this is actually something we looked at several, several months, like maybe even a year ago at this point, but a long time ago we looked at it when we were studying Ephesians, and Paul does this a lot, where he'll reference Jesus the Lord, and then he'll, like, a verse later talk about God in the same sentence, but he's talking about the same person. And so uh, Luke does this in almost that exact same way. Look at uh, chapter 8 and verse 39. Um, in the context, Jesus has just healed this man with a demon. Uh, this is the story of Legion. 
And then after uh, the demon has been cast out, we're going to pick up in verse, uh, verse 37. It says, Then all the people of the surrounding countries uh, of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they seized him with great fear, so he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. Now, we read that, and we don't have any issue with it, do we? We don't have any issue, right? Jesus is saying that, that it wasn't me, it was God who cast out those demons. It's the power of God that cast out the demons. And we don't even think about that, right? The very next line is, and he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. And we don't, like, for some reason, when I read that, I, I didn't go, oh, clearly he's, he's interchanging these. In my mind, it just, like, I don't know why. Maybe we really do just take that for granted. But, like, it almost looks like a mistake. If you don't believe that Jesus is God, you would read that and you'd be like, oh, man, this guy is a blasphemer. He thinks Jesus did this. But what Luke is doing is intentional. He's not flip-flopping because he's a sloppy writer. Luke is a physician. He, above anyone, knows the importance of detail. And as he's writing, he's interchanging these words to demonstrate the unity and the together, like the oneness of Jesus and God. They are the same. Uh, he does this as well with Jesus' references to uh, the kingdom. Throughout the early chapters, uh, when Jesus talks about the kingdom, my father's kingdom, a kingdom is coming. But then when you get to the very end, look at uh, chapter 22, Luke chapter 22. When you get to the very end of the book, you notice something different about the way that Jesus talks about the kingdom. So the first half, it's my father's kingdom. My father has given unto me authority. And then you get to chapter 22, and we're going to pick up in verse 28. Um, Jesus says, You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assigned to you as my father assigned to me a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So there's a lot more within this uh, short passage that Jesus is picking up on. But notice the possession of the kingdom. In the first half of the book, it's God's kingdom. Here, Jesus shifts that point of view. Is that an accident by Luke? Is it sloppy writing? Is it an, a misunderstanding? No. It's a literary device. It is an intentional showing of Jesus and God being one. Uh, one more thing we'll look at on this, the way he uses Jesus and God uh, almost entirely interchangeably throughout the narrative, um, has to do with the visitation. Uh, if you go back, and we don't have time to look at all of them, but if you look at, there are several psalms that talk about the visitation of the Lord. Um, that's a, a sort of a theme that runs through some of the Old Testament. Uh, look at chapter 1 in, uh, in Luke, Luke chapter 1. As, uh, as John the Baptist is, is being born, uh, his father, Zechariah, who was mute until John was born, uh, is able to speak again, and he gives this prophecy in the back half, I mean, not even half, in like the last 10 verses of chapter 1. And uh, look at verse 76, right, right about in the middle of the prophecy of Zechariah. He says, And you, child referring to his son John, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. Now there's a couple of things we need to pick up on here. It seems a little bit wordy, but there are really important keys that are that are being uh, that Luke is using in this account. Uh, one thing that is very important, we read in verse seventy six, "You will go before the Lord." The word "Lord" there is enormously significant. As you read through the Gospel of Luke, you notice him use that word over and over and over again, and he uses that word interchangeably for Jesus and God. 
That's really significant because in the Old Testament and the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, that word Lord is only ever used to refer to God. Okay? So anytime the God of Israel, the Lord God of Israel, uh, the, uh, the name of God, Yahweh, anytime that word is in the Old Testament, in the Septuagint, they translate that Lord. Right? And you'll notice this if you go in your Old Testament and you see Lord in all caps with the big L and then the capital O-R-D. Have if, if, if you seen that? If you notice that in your Old Testament, what that is, is Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. That is the name of God that has been translated into Greek, Lord, and then translated to English as Lord, or Greek, Kyrios, and then translated to English as Lord. And so that word is really important, has a lot of significance and weight to it. Zechariah is prophesying about his son, John, who we know later as John the Baptist, and he says that he is going to go before the Kyrios, the Lord, to prepare his ways. Who is John going before to prepare their ways? He's going before Jesus, okay? So then you go down a little bit further, and it talks about the forgiveness of their sins, which should immediately bring up some of the account in, uh, in Mark, who has the authority to forgive sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. There is a visitation from God from on high, okay? So then... Uh, that is going to give light to those who sit in darkness. And again, that is imagery that we, we talked about even on Wednesday uh, in our study of John. We'll pick back up on when we study that. So there's a lot going on within just these couple of verses. Most importantly, going before the Lord, but he's going before Jesus. And secondly, the uh, visitation from on high. That is God doing the visitation. So skip a little bit further in the gospel. Look at chapter 19. Look at chapter 19. Uh, Jesus is, is speaking here in chapter 19 in verse uh, 44. Yeah, well, let's, yeah, let's pick up in 40, 44. No, we can't. It's the middle of a sentence. 43. <coughs> Uh, Luke 19.43 says, For the days will come upon you uh, when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Okay. Jesus is talking about his visitation. He's connecting that idea of the visitation from on high to what was said at the beginning of the book and there's a deep connection to the entire Old Testament about the day of visitation of the Lord in, uh, in the Hebrew scriptures. Luke is clearly putting this in there, not to say that Jesus is visiting to prepare the way for the Lord. John was preparing the way for Jesus. Jesus is the visitation from on high. Again, Jesus is God. Um, second thing, similar to Mark, uh, second thing that Luke does, similar to Mark, he puts Jesus in places that God belongs. Like we mentioned in Mark, he does the, who is this that can forgive sins but God alone? Who is this that even the wind and seas obey him? He pictures Jesus walking on the water, which is something that God is pictured as doing in the Old Testament. He hovered over the waters in Genesis, and he tramples the waves in Job chapter 9. So that's how Mark does it. Luke does it similarly, uh, but with a little bit of a difference. Uh, let's look first at uh, Luke chapter 24. Well, let's start in chapter 4. I'm sorry. Let's look at Luke chapter 4 first, and then we'll go to Luke chapter 24. So in Luke chapter 4 is the uh, temptation of Jesus. And, uh, and as he's being tempted, one of his refutations in verse 8, it says, And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, says, God is the only one you worship and serve. That's it. Now, what's really interesting about Luke is that throughout the entire book, that's true. Uh, Matthew actually pictures Jesus being worshipped several times throughout his story. Uh, Mark shows little hints of it here and there. Luke doesn't do that. He doesn't show Jesus being worshipped until 
Now we'll go to chapter 22 until the very end, or chapter 24, the very end of the story as Jesus is ascending into heaven. Uh, Verse 50, he says, Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. So again, you notice the interchangeability of worshiping Jesus and continually blessing God. There's an interchangeability there between the two. And they worshipped Jesus. Who is the only one you're allowed to worship? From the beginning of the story, God is the only one worshipped. Those were Jesus' words. God is the only one you should worship. And then by the end of the book, the disciples of Jesus are worshipping him as well. Luke is not doing this haphazardly. He didn't make a mistake. He didn't go, oof. You're supposed to think these guys are blasphemers. He's making the same point he's making throughout the whole book. Jesus is God in the flesh. Uh, Look at Luke chapter 13. Jesus putting, uh, Luke putting Jesus in positions that that belong to God. Luke chapter 13, um, verse 17. He is... uh, Uh, dealing with his adversaries who are having an issue with him uh, doing things on the Sabbath. And then at the end of this interaction, in verse 17, it says, as he said these things, talking about Jesus, as Jesus said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by Jesus. So as Jesus said these things, Jesus' adversaries were put to shame. Okay, Now, here's one that we need to actually go back and read the passage. Look at Isaiah uh, chapter 45. Go all the way back to Isaiah chapter 45. And look at verse, uh, we're going to start in verse 15. It says, truly, you are a God who hides himself O God of Israel the Savior all of them are put to shame and confounded the makers of idols go in confusion together but Israel is saved by the Lord Kyrios with everlasting salvation you should not be put to shame or confounded to all eternity so notice who are the ones who are put to shame in this passage in Isaiah it's the makers of idols right the enemies of the, the Lord, and if you notice, this is one of those spots where the Lord is in all caps. That's the, the name Yahweh that has been translated. So the God of Israel's enemies are put to shame. And then in Luke chapter 13 and verse 17, like we just read, all his, not God's, but Jesus' adversaries were put to shame. So this is subtle and this is little, but this is how Luke does it. He has these stories going on he has these narratives running through and he throws these little phrases in there and it's like just this pop of an old testament reference and if you are studied in your old testament you pick up on way more of these than i do and you pick up on these little points where jesus where luke is associating jesus of nazareth with the god of israel uh he does this we're gonna look at just just one more in chapter 13 Uh, back uh, well go forward just a little bit to verse 34 it's this strange verse um, strange verse about Jesus gathering Israel under his wings so look at look at verse 34 Jesus says oh Jerusalem Jerusalem the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing so this is I mean, sometimes you read things and you think, what an odd way for someone to put that. What could that mean? A lot of times, those are meant to connect to something in the Old Testament and have more meaning because of it. Uh, You look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. uh, We have time. We have time. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, flip back over there, and then we're going to move to uh, Psalm 91. But in Deuteronomy 32, you have this same kind of image of uh, the children being under the wings. But 
again, it's associated not with Jesus or with a leader of the people, but with the God of Israel. So Deuteronomy 32 and verse uh, 10, he says, He found him in a desert land, and in the howling waste of the wilderness he encircled him, and he cared for him, and he kept him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreads out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. The Lord, that's again that word Yahweh or Kyrios, the Lord alone guided him. No foreign god was with them. He made him to ride on the high places of the land, and he ate the produce of the field, and he suckled with him, uh, and he suckled him with honey out of the rock and oil out of the uh, flinty rock. So we have an image of the God of Israel covering his people with his wings. Okay. Then you uh, move forward to Psalm 91. Psalm 91 has the same kind of image where the wings are covering the people. Look at Psalm 91 and 1 through 4. It says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to thee, Yahweh, to the Curios, I will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. So we've got these two images that are associated with the God of Israel, Yahweh, the Curios, the Lord. He is sheltering Israel under his wings. And then at the end, or right in the middle, I guess, of Luke's gospel in chapter 13, he describes Jesus as sorrowful over Jerusalem because he wanted to gather them under his wings. Same image, same line of reasoning, except instead of the God of Israel, it's Jesus in that spot. Luke is making the same simple yet incredibly profound point that Jesus is the God of Israel who has come to the earth. Last thing, and we, we have just enough time for me to introduce this and then we can, uh, we can study it more on our own and talk about it when we talk about John. Um, Luke likes doing things within story. Like when we, as we began, I, I mentioned that Mark will uh, have someone ask a question. Luke will weave the quotations into the story. Luke is telling kind of a story within a story. Um, the, the book had a, a really, really beautiful quote that I thought, um, that I thought depicted this well. Uh, he says, Luke's diction and imagery repeatedly evoke fragmentary Old Testament figures of the story of Jesus. So he's, he's saying the words that Luke uses and the images that Luke creates with his stories, they pull up these pieces of the Old Testament story, and they do it over and over again, and they show you how those Old Testament stories were, were foreshadowing of the story of Jesus. Uh, he continues and says, We might picture his narrative technique in the following way. It is as though the primary action of the gospel is played out on center stage in front of the floodlights, while a screen at the back of the stage displays a kaleidoscope series of flickering, sepia-toned images from Israel's scripture. It's really, really beautifully written. You see the idea of what uh, the author of this book was trying to get at. He's saying what Luke is doing is he is, he is giving you one story, and he's covering it or putting behind it the big story of Israel. And so you've got this gospel story of Jesus coming to the earth and living a perfect life and performing signs and giving teachings and dying on the cross, a death he didn't deserve to die. You have that on the front of the stage. And then you have Jesus' resurrection and his triumph over death. You have that story. And then behind it, sort of woven into the words of the story and woven into the images of the story, you have the story of the Bible. Uh, one of those that shows up really clearly is how Jesus uh, models the exodus from Egypt, right? The story of Jesus conquering death and coming out on the other side is a, a symbol or, well, is a culmination of what was shown in the first story of the exodus. So what 
Luke will do is he will take that whole story and behind it with the certain phrases and the certain images, like we looked at a couple of them, he will tell both stories. It's actually really cool, but it's hard to pick up on without reading the whole story, if you understand what I mean. And so uh, that's one I, I really want you to, uh, as you read through Luke, have that on your mind and try and pick up on some of the ways that he does that. Uh, one more quote from uh, this, this book. He said, the things that happen in Luke are the kind of things that happen in the stories of the patriarchs and the prophets. The action, while never identical to the Old Testament stories, is often suggestively reminiscent of Israel's past history. And so as you read through Luke, you zoom out and get the big picture, you'll see several different pictures that are all woven together in one story that Luke tells. It's a beautiful way that Luke does this. Again, the point of Luke's gospel is to tell you what God did in redeeming humanity through Jesus, who was God in the flesh. It's a beautiful message. It's told beautifully. And the more we understand about how Luke wrote it, the richer the meaning gets with every read. Uh, before we close, or as we close, I want to share just three quick things that I want us to take home from this whole study of reading backwards. I know it's been it's been a, a, a challenging study. It's been a challenging study for me, and it's been a lot of fun, but really difficult to get some of the uh, the little details in some of these these lessons. Um, but I think there are really important overarching points in reading the Bible like this that can benefit us enormously in our, in our Christian walk. Um, so we just got three of them, and we'll, we'll go through them fairly quickly. Uh, the first thing that we need to take away from reading backwards is read. The, just it. Just read. Read the book. Um, it, it is incredible how detailed the authors of the Gospels were able to be. They don't have the ability to put that much incredible detail into the story without, obviously, the inspiration and a deep knowledge of the Old Testament passages that they're referencing. Listen, when we, when we read the Bible, often we will read a chunk of it and then, uh, and then not think about it or, or check off our daily Bible reading box for the day. That is not remotely the type of reading that the Bible wants you to do. Look at Psalm chapter 1, and it's one that we're more familiar with, certainly, but Psalm chapter 1 talks about the kind of reading that the Bible wants you to do. It says that uh, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So here's what's really cool about that word meditates. It has this connotation of low, quiet, repeating, and mumbling to yourself. Constant thinking and chewing. I've used the example before. It's kind of gross, but it's kind of vivid and sticks out of a cow. You know, cows have the four-chambered stomach, and so they'll eat some grass one day, and they'll take it into that first chamber, and then it'll come back up, and they'll chew on it some more. And then they'll take it into that second chamber, and then they'll come back up, and they'll chew on it some more. It's gross, but it's how we should take the Bible in, all right? Listen, the Bible wants you to meditate on it. It wants you to take it in, think about it, chew on it, reflect on it, ask questions about it, take notes on it, reflect, come back to it, take it in again, read it again, read it in connection with this other passage over here. Uh, when, when we read the Bible the way it asks us to, to meditate on it day and night, to think about it, to repeat it to ourselves over and over. It says that that man is blessed. And then in verse 3, it describes him like a tree that is planted by streams of water and it yields fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and all that he does, he prospers. I mean, that is a beautiful promise of the kind of man that we can be if we read the Bible the way that God wants us to read it with meditation, with careful thought. Um, I, I want to make this point, too, that scholars, sometimes that word is, is misused um, because a scholar is just a learner. That's what the word really means. It, it's someone who is a learner of something. And so 
I think every single one of us has the ability to be a scholar of the Bible. And I think as Christians, we should be scholars of the Bible. There, you think about this. Um, until the invention of the printing press, Bibles were not common in everyone's home. People didn't have the ability. Just think about going back to, uh, to, to third, fourth, fifth century Christians and telling them, hey, it's going to be a while, but everyone will have a Bible in their home. In fact, they'll have some of them that they use for decoration. Like, I mean... It would have been unbelievable. Are you serious? You can read it anytime you want? That'd be incredible. Because that's not something that everyone has always had in history. We live in a time where I have 92 Bibles on one app, you know? This is an incredible blessing. And so what a scholar is, is someone who is a learner. As a Christian, we should be scholars of the Bible. We have access to it in a way that is profound throughout human history. And what scholars do is they read it and they think about it, and they note details, and they note that was a weird way to respond to a question. I wonder why he said it that way. That was an odd way that this author describes the armor that he was wearing. He didn't describe anybody else's armor. Huh, I've seen that phrase, living water, somewhere else before in the Bible. Where else does that come up? That's all a scholar does. They read, they note, they go back and look, and they say, oh, that's where it is. What is he saying there? Maybe he's saying that here. That's all a scholar does. And they come up with these ideas that this is probably what the scripture is telling us. And here is the message. And you know what most scholars come to? Jesus is God and he came to save us from our sins. This is one story that points to Jesus as the redemption of man. This is what Christians should be, is scholars of the Bible. Because we have more access to it than anyone else has in human history. This is what the Bible wants us to do. Read forwards, read backwards, understand the Bible in its bigger context, which is the second thing that we need to do is remember context is bigger uh, than just the verse before and the verse after. Do any of you use Bible Hub? I use Bible Hub all the time. I use all, they've got the interlinear Bible on there. It's really easy to follow. And it's one of my favorite tools. On Bible Hub, when you look up a verse, you look, you know, John 3, 16, and it comes up, you see it right here, and out to the side they'll have in context. Have you seen this? It's on the right side. It says that verse that you just looked at, that one verse in context. And what they do is they put the verse before it, John 3, 15, the verse you have, and then the verse after it. Sometimes that is helpful. But is that really the context of the verse? I, I, in this example, John chapter 3, Jesus is having a full-blown conversation with Nicodemus. And it spans many more verses to get the context. But more than that, that verse is in a whole chapter where Jesus is addressing different things. More than that, that verse in that chapter is in a whole book that one guy wrote as a coherent story about Jesus. More than that, that one book is within a canon of books or within a, 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 a list of books that all are unified and play off of each other repeatedly and use the same images and tell the same one story about God's redeeming humanity. Context is not the verse before and the verse after. It's not the chapter before and the chapter after. It's not the whole book. It's the entire, it's the whole Bible. When we ask what is the context, the context is the entire Bible. And we need to remember that the context is, much, is, is vitally important to understanding the book and is incredibly more vast than just what does that verse mean within that chapter. And the last part, these are all three, all three of these are very uh, interconnected, but uh, the last thing that I think we need to take from, from this study of the Bible is that we need to read the entire Bible in light of the cross. And we need to read the cross in light of the entire Bible. This is where we began the lesson, uh, the lessons. We need to read forwards to the cross and understand what is being said about the cross in light of all the things that have been done in the past. And we need to read backwards and understand what the cross now means about all of these stories that we've been hearing all along. Um, what, when you have both, which you have to have both, but when you have both, they enrich each other. They bring meaning out of each other. They make you understand the entire plan better. And so going back to the first thing that we need to do, we really need to read the Bible. 
uh, I am very bad at reading the prophets. I really am bad at it because I don't understand them as well, and they're hard, okay? If you don't think the prophets are hard, please come talk to me and show me what you know because you have a secret, okay? But reading the prophets are difficult. But you know what you can't get from the Gospels if you don't read the prophets? You can't get the allusions to the prophets. When Isaiah talks about soaring on wings like eagles, and then, and then in the Gospels you have Jesus ascending into heaven and there's that imagery where these things are fly. You're not going to track with that. When Jesus talks to the woman about, uh, at the well about having living water, that should trigger some ideas about water and where water's been used in the rest of the Bible. And if you aren't reading the rest of the Bible, you're not understanding everything that is written in the Gospels. And if you aren't reading the rest of the Bible in light of the Gospels, you're missing out on some of the incredible things that God was doing before people could understand what God was doing. As we are Christians, we need to read. We need to read slowly. We need to meditate on God's word. We need to understand the context is bigger than just a book or a chapter. And we need to read the Old Testament in light of the cross and read about the cross in light of the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says that the word of God is living and active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It can pierce between joint and marrow and spirit. And so listen, it is a powerful, powerful weapon. It's a powerful tool that God has given us, his word, the Bible. It is rendered ineffective if we do not use it. It is rendered ineffective in your life if you do not read it, if you do not meditate on it, if you do not look at the greater context, and if you do not see how the whole book is meant to be tied together in the story of God's redemption of man. So the challenge, the final challenge of this is not just read the Bible, but read it and use this incredible tool that God has given us. Like Dad mentioned this morning, we have an opportunity to teach so many people about this incredible story and this incredible document. And so let's use it. Let's use it and let's show people the story that God has wanted them to hear. Let's show him how this entire thing was written and history has been set in motion by God so that we can be with him forever in eternity. Isn't that a beautiful story? Isn't that a beautiful thing that people need to hear? God's word is living and active and powerful and he has given it to us as a tool so let's make sure that we do not take that for granted but we use it and we use it to teach others all about the love that God has for them in the story of the cross it is our custom to have an invitation the invitation is the invitation of the bible it's the, the story that's being told that's that's the invitation come be a part of this plan that God has set in motion to redeem man. He sent his son to die on the cross, to overcome death so that you could have life, so that we could be with God for eternity. That's what this is all about. If you have need of that, this is always a time where we can uh, take care of that need and show you what the Bible says. Put this tool in your hand and show you how powerful the story of God is. And if you have any other need of, of prayers of the church or if you need uh, a time of confession publicly, whatever you have need of. We have a loving body of Christ here who wants to help in any way. So if you have needs, come forward while we stand and sing.